I wanted to thank you guys for coming. Uh, this is a presentation that we've done a couple of times now in the spring. Um, it's basically exactly what it says, demystifying the, the US standardized testing tests and requirements and all that. Um, and being able to do this virtually is exciting because not only do we have Jay, who is um, the owner of Signet Education, but we have Sheila also joining us from Los Angeles, who is the president. Um, so you get the two, the two big guys here. Um, what we'll do is we'll go through the presentation. Um, and if you have questions, put them in the chat screen um, and then we'll get to them afterwards. So we get all the way through the presentation and maybe your questions will be answered, um, but put them through to the chat and then I'll uh, go through those afterwards. Um, please write them in English, not German, um, just so I can understand them. Um, but uh, if we are all set, then uh, I'll let you guys get to it. Thank you so much, Becca. It's wonderful to um, be with you and your families again in a totally different context this time. Um, so it'll be fun to experiment, and uh, I'm hopeful that we'll have a really good time with this presentation. Um, so the title of our presentation is Demystifying the SAT and ACT. Um, in this presentation, uh, we're going to cover the background of these two tests, um, why there's two tests, and, and what these. And then we're going to try to give you a sense of exact repair. Um, we want to make sure that you leave this presentation with a clear sense of how to move forward. So why are we uh, the, the folks to tell you about this? Um, so Signet Education, we always start with our values. We're a values-driven organization. Um, we care deeply. We're on the ball. We inspire confidence and we teach students, not subjects. And we constantly focus on uh, improving students' academic well-being across the board. Um, and we have a very specific focus in test prep, uh, tutoring, admissions, consulting, and academic coaching. As Becca knows, we become a partner to our partners like Becca, as well as our families, um, to provide uh, all sorts of different kinds of help throughout the entire high school journey. Um, and a little bit about us, uh, I'm Jay Bakrani, I'm the, the, one of the co-founders and the CEO of, of Signet Education. Um, I've been doing this for now about 15 years and I started actually as a test prep tutor. Um, so have a lot of experience with that directly. Uh, but now my passion is really thinking about that whole academic journey. And so you'll hear a little bit of that today um, in terms of thinking about how test prep fits into an academic journey. Um, and, and good, sensible, appropriate ways to approach it. And I'll let Sheila introduce herself uh, here as well. Hi, everybody. I'm Sheila. I just turned my video on for a minute so you can see me. I'll be off most of the time, but I'll come back to talk to you a little bit more about the specifics of the test. Um, I joined Signet in 2010. Uh, Jay and I are friends from college, old, old friends. Um, and I also started as a test prep tutor, but soon grew to manage our entire education department, all of our services, uh, and now serve as our president and COO. So when I talk to every client about their needs and help make a proposal for solving the problems that they specifically are facing. Uh, and I do a lot of um, managing the team and, and talking to our tutors and, and keeping people uh, up to date with, with what's happening. So that's my role in, in today's presentation too. Great, thank you, Sheila. And as I mentioned, our goals for today are really to have you walk out of here understanding what are these tests all about and what should we do about it as a family uh, for our students? How do we go about preparing? What are our options? When should we do it? So a lot to cover. I'm going to move relatively quickly, uh, but please, again, if you have any questions, put them in English in the chat, and when we get there, uh, we'll, we'll cover those. So first, I'd like to start with just a general, what are these tests? Why do we have, uh, what are the SAT and ACT? And what is the role of standardized tests or SAT and ACT in college admissions? So starting with that first question, uh, usually if we were in person, this would be a little bit more interactive, but here I'm going to just take the lead and answer for you. Uh, these are two college admissions entrance exams, essentially. Uh, they're not, um, the interesting thing is that these exams are not administered by the colleges themselves. 
They're not administered by the US government or Department of Education. They're private companies that have created two exams that are similar, and I'll explain why we have both in a moment. Um, and colleges have, uh, over the last you know, 100 years, have come to use these exams as a tool in the college admissions process. So a lot of colleges, so in the US, unlike in many other countries, uh, there's not a standardized educational system across all 50 states in every school. There's not a set of standard exams that every student takes. So comparing two students is like comparing apples and oranges in, some, in many contexts. So admissions offices often uh, like to see, most of them like to see some kind of standardized test score so they can really start to compare applicants uh, against each other on a standardized scale. And so it's important to understand how these tests play into the admissions process. Many, uh, if not most colleges in the US do what they call holistic admissions. Um, and that includes things like they look at grades, they look at SAT and ACT scores. And based on surveys that have been done of many of these colleges, those are two of the higher ranking things that they actually look at, two of the things that carry more weight. But they also look at extracurricular activities, summer activities, um, financial needs. Some colleges are looking at that when they're determining whether or not to admit somebody. Uh, work and internships, that kind of goes along with extracurriculars. Uh, teacher recommendations, personal essays, um, if there are any other standardized test scores, the application itself, uh, legacy status, meaning uh, th did your grandfather or grandmother and grandparents go there, did your parents go there, um, and the interview. Now, every school weights these things differently. Some care about um, some more than others. Some schools don't care about any of these things uh, or any specific, maybe uh, there are certain schools that don't care about legacy, for example. But the idea is that we're looking at holistic admissions. That said, it's still really important for most colleges to date uh, that they are evaluating some kind of standardized test score. So as we mentioned, grades and as I mentioned, grades and scores are pretty high up on the list in terms of what's important to most colleges. And that's how the SAT and ACT fit into the college admissions process, what, what the goal of them is. So many people ask, well, why are there two tests? And so quick little history lesson for you here. Back in the 1920s, um, this gentleman, Carl Brigham on the left, uh, was part of the army and, and participated in helping to develop the test that would determine whether somebody joining the army would be a uh, potato peeler or in charge of uh, you know, intelligence uh, analysis. And so, when, when that task was done, the president of Harvard at the time actually recruited him to develop an exam that would help uh, Harvard expand who they were bringing in, to, to, to think bigger than just bringing in the people from the general typical prep schools that they were recruiting from, but they needed some kind of entrance examination to do. And so he was brought in, and the, the test itself was designed generally to try to measure uh, what we might say horsepower. You're, it was originally called the scholastic aptitude test or for many years scholastic aptitude test. And the test was designed to try to, gen, to, to get a sense of how, uh, how smart are you? So in many ways it felt like a, a brain teaser or an IQ test if you've ever taken one. There was a lot of um, uh, complex reasoning and, and jumps that you had to make a big emphasis on vocabulary. And so that test was around from the 20s um, onwards. And then in the 50s, this gentleman on the right, uh, who's a professor of education in Iowa, said, you know, that's not a good way to assess uh, whether or not people should be admitted to a university. Uh, we should actually be assessing whether they learned what they were supposed to learn. So more like the standardized exams um, that you might have in a particular school to, to assess whether somebody learned the concepts they were supposed to learn. And so in the 50s, uh, he launched the ACT. So Carl Brigham launched the SAT, Everett Lindquist launched the ACT. And for many, many years, um, this uh, is not a political map, but a, a, a map of where the tests uh, were, were administered. And for many years, the geography looked like this. So if you lived in the Midwest, if you lived in Chicago, you would take the ACT and, and that would be it, right? You, you hadn't heard of the SAT, you didn't think it was that important. You took the ACT because you generally went to school closer to home. 
you lived on the coast where the, the SAT had its offices, uh, you would take the SAT and you wouldn't really think about the, the ACT. And that went on, uh, you know, for quite some time until probably even until uh, 2007, 8, 9, 10 was people still had a preference. But this is a graph of the number of test takers that took the SAT and the ACT in the U.S. And you can see in 2012, there was an inflection point. And at that point, more people began to take the ACT than the SAT. And so why did that happen? So what's happening in the world of college admissions, and it's still happening today, is because applications are done on the internet, because colleges can recruit nationwide, and at a click of a button, people can apply to different schools, competition for applicants has gone way through the roof. So previously, schools would say we have a preference for one or the other test. But now schools uh, basically say, look, if we want to get the best candidates, we need to take either test. And some schools are even saying uh, we're not taking, we don't need any tests anymore. But that's the minor minority of schools. But in many cases, schools are saying, hey, we've got to do something to make sure that we can attract the best candidates. We don't want to keep candidates out because they didn't take a particular test. So that's a little history lesson as to why we have two tests um, and the role that those tests play in the application process. And so now I want to turn it over to Sheila to talk to us a little bit more about what's specifically on each of these exams. Thanks, Jay. Everybody still with us? Um, so um, I'm just going to kind of walk through these slides as Jay moves us ahead. So first, this is an overview of what's on the SAT versus what's on the ACT. You'll notice some similarities and we'll talk about the differences uh, in, in the following slides. But um, here we've got a, a graphic that shows us the timing and the order of the various sections on the SAT. So the SAT has four required sections, reading, then writing and language. Then there are two math sections, one without a calculator and one with, and then there's an optional essay. So the overall uh, length of the test is three hours and 50 minutes. Uh, that's without the essay, right? Um, uh, no, sorry, that's including the essay. Uh, the ACT has uh, four sections as well, but they go in a different order. We start with English, uh, which is the analogous section to the writing and language section on the SAT. Then we have one math section, we have a reading section, and then we have a science section and then an optional essay of 40 minutes for a total test time of three hours and 35 minutes. Um, go ahead, Jay. Thanks. So the tests are scored in different ways. Um, the SAT is out of a total of 1,600 points, um, 800 points available for the math sections, and then another 800 points available for the combined reading and writing sections. And then the essay score is given separately. The ACT is out of 36 points total. Um, you can get up to 36 points on each of the four sections, and those are averaged to give you what we call a composite score of 36. And then its essay score is also reported separately. Separately. Um, there are official concordance tables that have been put together by the two testing companies. They actually coordinated on this effort um, because colleges, as Jay just explained, will accept either test without bias between them. But if they want to be able to compare an ACT student to an SAT student, they need some sort of baseline uh, that they can use. So there are official concordance tables that were released in 2018. They are publicly available. So you can see if you take an ACT, what would that uh, be on the SAT and vice versa. Um, how does your SAT compare to uh, an ACT score? Uh, the last bullet on this slide is about super scoring. Now, super scoring means that if a student takes a test on multiple dates, the college will take the best section scores from each of those test administrations and put them together as though the student did that on one day. So let's say I'm doing the SAT and I take one in June, I do far better on the verbal section than I do on the math, then I take it again in October and it switches, I do better on the math than I do on the verbal. Well, a college that super score is gonna take the verbal score 
from my June test and add it together with my math score from my October test and treat that as my total score. Now, the majority of colleges do this, and so it makes it easy for students to take the test multiple times um, and continue to improve their score. Um, it is now official policy for the ACT to super score, and the SAT, it's been sort of de facto their policy with colleges that they super score now. So um, there's no harm in taking the test multiple times. That said, we really discourage students from taking it more than three times um, because you've got to do something radically different if you want a radically different score if you've gotten the same score or around the same score about three times um, you might be at your limit or you may need to change your strategy altogether so now to dig into the content of the test, what is actually tested, both the SAT and the ACT have their math sections. The SAT does it in two separate sections and the ACT does it in one, but they both cover the same topics. Arithmetic, which is your basic addition, fractions, ratios, percentages, algebra, solving for X in a, in a variety of situations, geometry, um, area, uh, perimeter, um, coordinate geometry, uh, and then some trigonometry. It's at a very basic level. So usually students should have taken an Algebra 2 course or a, a trigonometry course in order to be prepared for um, this test. If they have only done up to geometry, uh, the amount of trigonometry is a very small amount and a tutor or a review book can give them the, the skills that they need to succeed. Um, the main differences between the SAT and ACT math section are actually quite stark. This is one of the places where you see the biggest differences. Because the legacy of the SAT is sort of this IQ aptitude test, uh, some of that brain teaser quality has really persisted, um, even as the test has moved closer to an achievement test, which is how we categorize the ACT. So on the SAT math section, you see longer word problems. You see a lot of setup to your problems. You see um, concepts from a arithmetic being combined with concepts from geometry that normally students when they're practicing practicing this in school or even being tested in school those concepts are are discrete they're separate from one another so students really have to be good at um, thinking outside the box thinking strategically avoiding uh, clever traps and tricks um, on the SAT math section and to go into a little bit more detail about the SATs two sections you have a no calculator section and you have a calculator section on the no calculator section the problems are mostly challenging arithmetic and algebra problems that require a lot of hand solving and manipulation of exponents and things like that uh, that can be very intimidating for a lot of students you really have to have the processes of algebra down to do well on that section. Um, and then you have your calculator section, which uh, changes the calculation piece of it. Um, the ACT, uh, by contrast, is far more straightforward and far more uh, similar to a math exam that your student has probably seen in, in high school. Um, the concepts are tested in discrete ways. Uh, there are still word problems, but they are far more focused. A uh, little less work needs to be done to figure out what you actually need to do to solve the problem. Uh, and so there are more questions on the ACT. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but uh, students who have a solid grasp of concepts and can move quickly tend to do better on the ACT math section. One thing I'll just uh, add here, Sheila, is that um, the students who are learning uh, math, uh, your students who are learning math in German, um, they're going to know all of these concepts. Uh, in fact, they probably know them better than, than many of their American counterparts. But the challenge uh, for them often is the presentation of the problems and the language. So sometimes for, for German students or students who, for whom German is their first language, um, it, the studying is really about learning the translation and learning the patterns that are presented here, um, not necessarily the concepts themselves. Right. And, and by and large, we find that students whose um, first language is not English or have a preference for a, a language other than English tend to do better on the ACT. We can talk about that more as well. So the English section, this is called uh, writing on the SAT and English on the ACT, is really a grammar test. Um, and these two sections are extremely similar. 
students get a passage uh, and words, phrases, entire sentences are underlined and each of those represents a question. The student may need to choose a correct grammatical choice, uh, move a sentence around to make more sense in the paragraph that it's in, or add material to form a good topic sentence or concluding sentence. Um, so while the vast majority of these questions focus on grammatical, syntactical rules of the English language. Um, there are questions about diction, meaning which is the right word for the tone of this passage, and also style. Um, so given that this may be a slightly scientific passage, what would be a better choice for ending this paragraph? You know, and then you get a couple of options. Now, the differences between the SAT and the ACT are very minuscule in this section. Um, they're, they're almost exactly the same. So the reading section of both of these are, are pretty similar. Reading comprehension is pretty standard across the board. Um, you get a number of passages and you have to answer questions of varying scope. Some of them may ask about the larger purpose or main idea of a passage, and some of them will uh, go down to a very narrow scope of what does this particular word mean in this particular sentence. Um, so these questions are often very uh, familiar to students. They understand what to do with these types of questions. The thing that is challenging for them is always looking for the evidence. When we do reading or literature or uh, uh, an English or even a German literature class, we are often asking students to interpret uh, texts. These standardized tests do not call for interpretation. The answer is going to be very clear in the text of the passage, and that's often the biggest skill we need to train students on, is to look for the evidence in the passage and then choose your answer based on that. Um, there are some differences between the SAT and the ACT. Uh, reading sections. Uh, in general, the SAT passages are at a slightly higher reading level. They tend to be a little longer than the ACT reading passages. Um, there is also a particular question type that only exists on the SAT, which is you answer a typical reading comprehension question, and then the next question says, where is the evidence for your answer to the previous question? So it's kind of a paired question, and, and students often struggle on those. On the ACT, uh, the reading section is one of the shortest sections. It's only 35 minutes, so students do need to move very, very quickly, but it is far more empirical than the SAT. It's very clear to the student where they need to go for the answer, and the answer choices aren't quite as tricky as, as the SAT ones. And now we get to the science section on the ACT. Now, for a lot of students who, whatever reason, they don't like science, they think, oh, I'm definitely not going to take the ACT because of the science section. Um, but that's usually a, a false belief. Um, the science section is really not counting on students to have any advanced knowledge of science or be good at science. Really what it is is a, a technical passage uh, that is accompanied by graphs or charts and students need to perform the same kind of empirical evidence finding uh, protocols that they used on the reading section. So we often find with some practice students score very similarly between the reading and science section on the ACT. Um, now the SAT doesn't have what they call an explicit science section but they have recognized the value of having these types of sort of data analysis chart reading questions on their tests. So what the SAT has done is that some of the passage in the writing section or passages in the reading section will come along with charts and will be of a more technical nature than say a fiction passage. And so they've sort of interspersed the questions that would show up on a science section throughout the other types of sections on the SAT. Whereas the ACT has this all in one very, very short 35 minute section. All right, now both of the tests have optional essays. Um, the SAT calls it an essay, whereas the ACT calls it writing, which could be a little confusing. But um, they're both optional, and not many colleges in the United States require these essays. So usually before we have a student commit to taking the essay, we like to talk about the college list a little bit first to make sure it's even required. Um, the basic task is that the student needs to respond in a coherent way to a prompt uh, and show off some analysis. 
skills. So the SAT essay prompt is a persuasive essay, usually something like an op-ed or an introduction to a book where somebody is really trying to make an impassioned plea for some sort of argument. And their task is to analyze the rhetorical elements that allow this, this author to make a successful argument. So you're talking about word choice, figurative language, use of evidence, things like that. Um, and they're not really arguing for or against a topic. They're really analyzing how a different author is making their argument. Whereas the ACT has a totally different prompt. Um, students are given a topic that doesn't have a clear right or wrong answer. And they're given three different people's perspectives on that topic. Um, and they're not always perspectives that um, are mirror images of each other. It's not like one person says yes and the other person says no. Um, there is a, a claim about the topic or the stance that people should take on it and then some various reasoning for um, why they should take that that stance. And what students are asked to do is, is quite a hefty task. They need to analyze each of those three perspectives, talk about their strengths and weaknesses, discuss which one they most agree with, and if it's different, they need to give their own opinion on the topic and their own reasoning. So there are a lot of things that students can respond to in that prompt. We like to give them a very clear set of instructions that pairs that down and focuses it a little bit more. Um, but they're two very different tasks. Right, so in summary, the content is pretty much shared between the two of them. The math content is the same, the grammar content is the same, reading content generally the same, so is the science content. But there are differences when it comes to the format of the questions, as well as the timing, which is something we didn't really talk about. Um, and, and I would say the timing is really the major difference between the two of them. Um, the SAT gives students more time per question Whereas the ACT, you have less time per question. And that could lead to a difference in preference for, for different students. You know, some students just take a little bit longer to process information or to do the math. Uh, in, in those cases, the SAT may be a better test for them. Um, it can also be a trade-off because the ACT questions tend to be a little more straightforward, less of that brain teaser feel. So students can move more quickly. And therefore, it doesn't really matter that there's less time per question because they're, they're a little easier to process. That's not to say that one test is easier than the other. Um, what it means is every student is going to have their own natural preferences, and it makes a lot of sense for you to figure out which test the student should focus on um, instead of trying to do both. Really, you want to play to their natural strengths. Uh, and Jay is going to tell us how we can do that. Thank you very much, Sheila. Um, and so we're, we're at a point in the presentation where I would typically ask for questions uh, from the audience, but we're going to leave the questions until the end. But just want to remind you, um, any questions, anything that's not clear, pop it into the chat and we'll make sure that we, we uh, cover those at the end. So part two now is, uh, well, what do we do about all that information? Now we understand where these tests came from, what role they play in the admissions process and at a very general level. Um, and we understand that there are two tests. They have uh, pretty high, like general level content that you would learn in, in, in most high schools. Um, and they're shared content across those tests. And, and we know at some point, most students are, who are applying to American colleges are going to have to take those tests. Well, where do we go from here? And that's what part two is all about. So uh, before we dive into to the full version of preparation, I wanna address the elephant in the room here, which is COVID-19. My understanding is that many of you here are not in 11th grade, um, but essentially we have uh, had some test cancellations, which we'll go over later, and we will very likely see more cancellations as we go, at least probably through June. So for those people who are juniors here, we'll discuss that in a second, that changes things a lot. But for those of you who are sophomore or below, doesn't change a thing, at least at this point. Um, some colleges have issued uh, statements saying that they're going to relax their policies around test prep, or, or sorry, around uh, standardized test uh, scores. But what we've been seeing is by and large, a lot of universities, especially more competitive ones, are not changing their policies yet. Uh, and uh, some have come outright and said, we can't do admissions effectively without uh, a standardized test. Um, so even though there's a lot of that swirling around, uh, we are generally of the mind that it, it makes sense to continue on the path of preparation for 11th graders. If you have specific questions about this, uh, Becca is the person to talk to. 
uh, she'll have a much more specific understanding of this vis-a-vis -vis, uh, students at the German school. There is some talk of forthcoming online tests. So if testing is not available in, in the fall in person, uh, SAT and ACT may issue online tests. Uh, typically, you have to go to a test center, which is generally at a school. You schedule as far in advance as possible. You go, you sit for the exam, you turn it in, you come home. Uh, there is talk of moving the tests online. We have no idea what that's going to look like and how successful that might be. But for, for students in younger uh, grades, grades lower than, than 11, uh, that may be something that they do end up seeing down the line, but we're not banking on it so much at this point. And so our recommendations for 10th graders and below, we're going to give you exactly what to do through the rest of this uh, uh, section. For 11th graders, Basically, you just are in a holding pattern right now to figure out when you can actually book your test. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so at this point, uh, our general advice is, is to stay the course in light of COVID. In fact, uh, depending on your grade level, now might be a great time to do more preparation because you actually have a little bit more time and space in your schedules. Uh, less commute time, less extracurricular activities might be a good time to just knock out test prep and get it out of the way, again, depending on your grade. Um, so again, for those 11th graders, we'll talk about this a little bit more. Uh, I'll recommend exactly how to consider when to take those tests when we come to the timelines. In the uh, Sheila, anything to add here? Uh, not much. I mean, I think the the main headline here is uncertainty. Um, the test makers are really trying to. Sheila, I think your audio might be um, uh, breaking up quite a bit. Uh, can you hear me okay? No. Um, it might make sense to sign out and sign back in um, to the meeting. Uh, I'll keep us going, and then when, when Sheila comes back, uh, if she has anything to add, we'll bring her back. Oh, okay. I'm getting a, a notice on the chat that you all could hear her okay. Um, mine on my end. This is the Wild West in terms of uh, presenting together. Okay, Sheila is back. I am back. I didn't really have anything to add, so you're fine to move forward. Go ahead. All right, so I'm going to keep going here. Sheila, I can't hear you very well, so this will be a test to our, our partnership and our ability to present together. Um, so the steps here of presentation. The first step is to diagnose and plan. Uh, so before we dive into any type of preparation for these tests, what we want to do is get to start by understanding which of those two tests is the best test. As Sheila uh, so clearly described, um, there are differences and they're slight, but they're meaningful. So what we see anecdotally is about 50% of kids will score about the same on both tests. But many students will, will have a preference. Either they feel better on a particular test or their score is much higher. And as Sheila mentioned, very often students who, for whom English is not their first or primary language often tend to prefer the ACT, though it goes both ways. So we go through a deliberate process with our students of diagnosing which test they should take first, and then starting a, to create a plan around where they're, where they're starting from, where they wanna go, and how they're going to get there. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. The next step is to start learning. So, uh, a lot of students are going to have to learn content or refresh content that, that's not familiar to them. So especially for students uh, transitioning from, from German, they're going to have to learn the different the, the theory, the patterns. Um, so the next step is, is once we diagnose and plan, we really start by learning the things that students don't know to make sure they have a good solid knowledge base for the test. Then they practice, uh, and these two things happen together, right? We learn and practice at the same time. Um, but then there's a phase of practice, and then finally we go for an actual test, and then we repeat this cycle. Um, as Sheila mentioned, we can repeat this cycle two, uh, sometimes three times, uh, and colleges have no problem with that. Uh, but once you go over three times, colleges start to say, 
generally, why is this person taking this test so many times? And uh, didn't they have anything better to do with their free time than, than test and retest? Uh, so we generally like to say students should plan for two or three testings. Um, for students in 11th grade now, that may not be possible. They may need, need to plan for fewer. But the idea is that you're shooting for a target, you're preparing for that target, you're getting yourself ready, you're testing, and then you've got to redo once or twice if you don't meet your goal the first time around. And so thinking about this, we like to kind of put out there, what is the fastest way to more points? So a lot of people say, well, if I hire a tutor, I get this tip and this trick, or if I should use this particular book, or um, you know, how do I get my score up? Well, you get your score up through hard work, good old fashioned hard work. So this is anecdotally what we've seen. It's not a rule. A lot of kids come in and put in far less work and get high scores, and a lot of kids come in and put a lot of work and don't get the score improvement that they want. Generally speaking, to get uh, up to 30 points score improvement or one point on the ACT, you get seven to 10 hours of tutoring and preparation together. That's not just tutoring. Uh, you're gonna see a minor increase, but that's not a lot of time if you think about it. You could do that in a couple of weeks. Um, 30 to 70 points are two point ACT increase, uh, 15 to 20 hours, 70 to 130 points, three or four point increase. That's where we generally um, find most of our students are shooting for is 40 to 50 hours, which might sound like a lot, but if you think about four hours of, of prep over a week, uh, maybe, maybe some tutoring, then some independent study or just independent study over 10 weeks, a little bit more than two months, uh, that's not a lot of time over the long haul. Um, and then finally, anything above that, uh, you're really looking at 75 hours or more. Again, some students will put in 15 or 20 hours and get 200 point increase because everything was there, just not clicked together. But I start with this slide to help students and parents and families understand that it's, this is just a matter of putting in the work uh, over time, a certain amount of discipline. And we'll talk a little bit more about that and what these in a moment. So what's the timeline? Uh, I will comment because it, it, uh, I've got a two-year-old now, and sometimes I'm even wondering, man, is she learning what she needs to learn in, in, in daycare? Uh, but timelines seem to creep early and earlier uh, for, for parents and students over the years. But we're going to share with you what we generally recommend as a standard timeline. So here it is. At the end of sophomore year or 10th grade, um, we would do a diagnostic exam and help a student begin to plan. Now, not every student will need to begin uh, prep at that point, but we like to start at the end of sophomore year because things are fresh and generally students have a fair amount of time over summer and even into the beginning of junior year. Some students might prep uh, over sophomore summer in order to make sure that they're getting ahead. Maybe they have aggressive sco score increase uh, requirements, or maybe they just want to get ahead and in junior year, they know their year is going to be quite busy. Um, so students will prep over sophomore year. So we'll begin prepping in fall of junior year. We generally recommend that students are taking uh, two or three tests. And ideally they're done in junior year, though they can certainly be pushed into senior fall if necessary. Now for those 11th grade parents and families on the call, it's important to note that if you haven't gotten testing done already, you may be looking at the spring of junior year and not being able to test at all. Because as of right now, uh, the only tests that are are the ACT in June. Um, we'll, I'll show you the test, and we, we think that's actually likely going to get canceled. So what does that mean for you juniors? Well, it means that now is the time to prepare, and you may not have the opportunity to take multiple tests in the fall, either because your college, you wanna apply early and the college requires a score sooner, or because there may be a shortage of testing dates uh, come fall. And so depending on uh, what you end up, uh, what your plan ends up being for admissions, you may only have one shot. So we generally recommend to, to begin prep. You may begin now, you may begin it in a month or two months at the, at, you know, over summer, but at that point to prep uh, diligently for whatever fall test uh, is going to be available. So if you need a little bit of motivation. And so what does that process look like, that outline? Well, first we start by picking a test, as I mentioned. This is a bit more of a deep dive into the diagram I showed you earlier. 
Then we want to define a goal score. Okay, we start with a test. We know where we stand. We want to define where we want to get to. I'll tell you a little bit more about how we do that. Uh, you want to pick a test date or a couple uh, if you have the luxury of that kind of time. So exactly what you're shooting for. You want to make a prep plan. Uh, and then after that, you want to practice and refine. So I'm going to go into each of these in a little bit more depth. So first you want to pick a test. So you may have a PSAT uh, that can count as a diagnostic exam for the SAT. That's an exam that's given uh, in school uh, in earlier grades. Um, but if not, then what you want to do is you actually want to take a full exam SAT and of the ACT as a practice. You don't want to sign up for this. You don't want to go in and record the score and pay the extra money for it. Uh, and you can't now, frankly. Um, but you just want to take those practice exams in as ideal conditions as possible that replicate testing conditions. So uh, how do you do that? Well, contact us. We'll send you the exams. You can take them. Uh, we'll score them for you for free. And we'll help you understand them and interpret them after that. Um, and if you don't want to do that, there's certainly resources online where you can learn how to, uh, to where to download those tests. But uh, we generally recommend contacting us. This is a service we do for the German school uh, for free, um, just as partners of ours. What are you looking at? Well, when you take those tests, you want to look at first the quantitative, which one did I score higher on? But you also want to look at the qualitative because some students have a knee jerk or gut reaction to those tests. For some students, that SAT, even though they scored maybe similar on the two tests, feels really good, and the ACT feels terrible. And so you want to take that into account as you're thinking about uh, which test to choose. After that, you really want to stick to one test. You can switch. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter so much in terms of the college prospects, but you really don't want to bounce back and forth. Um, and the reason for this is that while the tests are different uh, or similar, they're different in enough where it makes it focus your time, effort, and energy on preparing for one of them. Uh, that said, if you prepare for side switch, all that work will carry you. It's just easier to focus on one test than to switch back and forth. And there's absolutely, utterly no benefit in submitting uh, both tests to a university. It does not do anything for your candidacy. Now, this advice is a little bit different for 11th graders currently. 11th graders currently, after you do that diagnostic, uh, we would advise you to keep a bit of an open mind because we're unclear right now which, whether the SAT is going to be available first or the ACT, whether one will move online or both will move online, how many testing dates will be available. And so we would generally recommend keeping a slightly more open mind given the, the, what's going on with COVID. Um, but to generally to pick one and work towards it, if you were to work with a talented tutor, that tutor could help you prepare um, the general material that would apply for both in the initial period. And then, you know, by that point, you'd likely have information to choose uh, which test to, to choose and stick with. So you've picked a test. Now you want to define a goal score, because if you just start off by prepping uh, and saying, I just want to do as well as possible. You don't actually know how much work or time or effort or energy you need to put in. So here's some factors to consider. The first uh, and biggest one that you'll want to talk to Becca about is your uh, college goals. So the colleges to which you would like to apply, uh, what are they expecting for scores to be a competitive applicant? So that end all be all uh, what you need to score, but it's certainly a good place to start thinking about what your goal should be. Uh, we've got a little chart here uh, that shows, generally speaking, if you're looking at, at uh, the most competitive schools, we'll start there and go downwards, you're looking in the high, seven, 700, high 600s to 700s and above, um, and even higher for Ivy League. Um, for highly competitive schools, these are schools you still have a name of, we're looking in the mid 600s and above, and that's for each section. So if you put those together, it would be you know, 650, 650, 1300 average and above, uh, 1400 average and above for the more competitive schools. Now, again, this is not, this is as much an art as it is a science in terms of figuring out how you stack up against this. And so you absolutely should talk to Becca when you're thinking about what kind of goal score you need. If there are uh, families from other schools, uh, you may not talk to Becca, but talk to your uh, college advisor in your school. So, 
you also want to think about your diagnostic score starting point. So if you started, let's use the SAT for example, let's say you started at a 1200 and you, hey, I want to get a 1600. Well, that's a 400 score, 400 point score increase. And if you remember chart, that's a lot of hours. And so you really need to make sure uh, that the gap that you're, you're choosing is reasonable. What we generally recommend is start with something reasonable for the SAT, maybe 100 or 150 points. Get to that point and then recalibrate and say, okay, I got to my goal score. Whether that's can I do more? Can I do better? Um, but you also want to always compare that with your uh, college. You definitely want to think about your motivation, how much time and effort and energy are you willing to put in, and you need to think about the time that you have between school, extracurricular activities, all of that. All of that should come together in a good, solid uh, kind of assessment of where you want to shoot for. You want to be reasonable, though you want, you want to push yourself, but you want to be reasonable. An unreasonable, the surefire way to lose motivation uh, and really put a, a dark cloud over the course of your preparation. So just to remind you again, uh, if we're thinking about uh, really aggressive score increases, uh, then you really need to make sure that you have the time to do that. So the next step is you want to pick a test date uh, or three. Um, and so the dates that are crossed off here are the dates that are no longer available. We believe that the June test is likely going to be canceled on the ACT, July maybe as well. Um, likely by fall, we're going to have tests available for those 11th graders. Uh, the talk that the testing companies will be actually administering tests more frequently in fall because they weren't able to um, in, in spring. And so generally speaking, you want to think about choosing a test uh, you know, depending on where, when you're starting, if you're a sophomore, um, you're going to want to thinking testing in late sophomore year. So say in December, uh, January, maybe, or sorry, junior year. So you start in sophomore summer and then or to the end of your first semester or the first term in junior year, you'll want to take a test. And then you might want to do one or two in spring. Uh, in April or June or March or May for the SAT, depending on which one you choose. So for juniors right now, uh, it's really unclear which test to choose. But for sophomores, uh, based on that diagnostic exam, you'll want to start choosing some test dates to target. If you're a sophomore, uh, you take that diagnostic in summer, you do really well, there's no reason you can't think about testing early next year in, say, September or October or, or, or October or November. Not that many students end up doing that, but absolutely, if you can get your goal score earlier, get it out of the way, you have a lot more time, effort, and energy to focus on other things that are uh, uh, really important to you. I would add, uh, Jay, I hope you And can then you want to make a plan. So uh, here's a sample plan. I'm going to do this at a very high level. Um, so let's say you took a diagnostic exam. The scores were generally equivalent, but you felt better on the SAT. The timing was worked better for you. Uh, so you choose the SAT. And let's say your starting score was 1130 and your goal score is 1400 or above. So that's a lot of points uh, that you need to make up. So you need to be thinking uh, of creating a test prep plan over a, a generally longer period of time. We're thinking at least six months or so. Uh, so let's start with, let's say you're starting, not today, but let's say you're starting at the end of your year, if you're a sophomore, um, you want to then think about those test, test dates. So in this case, using this example, it wouldn't be TBD. It would be, uh, let's say you're starting at 1130. You want to get to 1400. You're starting to prepare over the summer of sophomore year. You might think about one test uh, in late fall, November or December, and then one or two more tests in early spring. Uh, and that would give you plenty of time. Now, a lot of people say, well, hey, isn't that a ton of time to be preparing? And yeah, it is. It's quite a lot of time. Um, but you can always test sooner, assuming there are spots available, if you get to your goal score sooner than that. Now, for some students, we, we don't recommend prepping over summer of sophomore year. We sometimes recommend going into junior year because uh, you just need more time in the classroom to learn the material that you want to learn. But this is generally not the plan you should necessarily use. We can help. Uh, but, oh. Sheila, I'm going to add you in here. Yes. Okay. 
Thank you. I think everyone else can hear me, but I don't think you can. Uh, so Jay, you may not hear me, but everyone else, I want to add something here. Um, one thing to consider if you are considering one of these early fall dates, August, September, which the SAT is planning to introduce, or uh, the September ACT, what have you, if the COVID-19 situation is still the situation we have right now, both of the test makers have committed to an online test at home, which means it would be delivered through your own personal computer. Uh, and they've got some idea for what to do with their um, with security. I'm not really sure how that's going to work, but they're promising that that will be in place by August. My recommendation is not to be a guinea pig for the first round of online at home tests. So even if your student is ready to take the test, unless they absolutely have to, if they're a junior and this is really the only time they're going to have, uh, excuse me, a rising senior, this is the only time they're going to have to take a test before their early deadlines come. Um, I would say avoid that August online at home test. Um, avoid also the first ACT online at home test if you can, um, because there are likely to be logistical challenges, security breaches, you know, all of the things that can go wrong with something like this, a big logistical move like this probably will go wrong. Uh, and you don't want your student to have studied to take a test only to find that it was a frustrating experience, they didn't perform as well as they could have, or the test score gets canceled because of a security breach. So that's just a little bit of advice about um, those August, September test dates this coming fall in 2020. Thank you, Sheila. Um, wonderful, and the last thing in terms of the test prep plan is how much time do you have available? Um, so now a lot of students have a lot more time, uh, so it might be a great time to start. Uh, but when you're thinking about a plan, you want to make sure it's realistic according to the time that's available. And so a good prep plan has three phases and it has phases and milestones. You want to learn and understand the material, practice in context, and then master the test. Some things to consider. Uh, what sections are you going to work on when? So are you going to start with the weak sections or the strong sections, the reading or the math? How are you going to sequence that? When are the practice tests scheduled? So practice testing for these exams is one of the most uh, important elements of a prep. We generally, generally recommend students take actual practice tests anywhere from every month, depending on the trajectory of their plan. And so when are those scheduled? And you can use those as milestones, intermediate milestones. How much time per week will be devoted? We have students actually commit to specific blocks of time. Um, saying, I'm going to do it in this at school, plus on this day after school, and uh, once on the weekend. Um, we generally like to see students putting in three to five hours of um, prep per week as kind of a baseline, as an average. And then, importantly, when will you ask for help? If you're prepping on your own as a student, uh, when will you know you're spinning your wheels and wasting your time, and who will you ask for help? And then how will you know if you're ready? Again, that kind of comes back to testing uh, the, the, the practice test. But there are many students who um, kind of dive into this and then just go and sit for a test. And they don't actually even know where they stand or where the, whether they're ready. Again, this is all, these are all things to consider. Um, if you're interested in learning more about this, uh, we actually have a guide. You can email us afterwards. We can send you that guide, uh, which goes into a little bit more detail or in a diagnostic conversation that we might do with you, we would absolutely help you think through these um, after that diagnostic test with a score that we actually have. Uh, finally, if you have accommodations as a student, uh, how are you gonna practice those accommodations? We won't get into that much today, but you can certainly email us afterwards if you have extra time or your student has some kind of accommodation uh, that can range uh, all different kinds of accommodations. But if you have any kind of learning difference, uh, you want to be practicing with those. This is a, just a snapshot from that guide that I mentioned. If you email us, we can email you the guide. It gives you a template for thinking about how to create a plan like this. So in terms of accommodations, I'm going to speed through this just because we're a little tight on time. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, if you have a learning difference and it's documented, uh, you, you can request accommodations from the SAT and ACT. Uh, if you do that, you absolutely need to help uh, make sure that that's being practiced along the way. Um, and, you know, if, even if you do get those accommodations and your student isn't performing well on, on account of a learning uh, difference, you really need to think through uh, whether it's worth the stress and the pain of this test, these tests, uh, and whether some that don't require tests might be a good fit. 
Um, and you apply for those through your school's coordinator. Um, I believe that that would be Becca uh, in, in Boston, um, but you can inquire and, and get that information from your school. Again, if you have more questions on this, we can give you a really personalized understanding of this. Um, just reach out to us uh, afterwards. Finally, lastly, some keys to great preparation. What does great prep look like? Well, you have to be regular. It's, it's a little bit done in a regular way over a long period of time makes a big difference. A week here and a week there uh, is not nearly as good as a couple of hours every week over the course of many, many weeks uh, or months. Accountability is important. Some students can hold themselves accountable, but other students, it's difficult. This is not necessarily that urgent if you're preparing ahead of time. Um, and sometimes it's scary. So sometimes it helps to have a coach, a tutor, uh, a teacher, or a parent who can uh, gently and lovingly hold a student accountable to whatever it is that their goals are. Students should have a deliberate approach. I, I can't tell you how many students I've, I've met who, uh, before coming to us, they just buy a book, they open it up, they start prepping, they work on the stuff that's easy for them, they avoid the stuff that's hard, or they just kind of do a bunch of practice problems. And that's just a recipe for wasting a bunch of time. Our philosophy is you should spend as little time on this to reach your goals as possible. The more deliberate you are, uh, the less time it's going to actually take. You've got to be honest with yourself, with your family. What do you actually want to accomplish and how much work are you actually willing to put in? Um, it, it just, it might sound good to say you want a high score, but, but are you truly willing to, to do that, to put the work in for that? Additionally, you also have to be honest with yourself because uh, you have to understand when you're hitting a plateau, most students do, you have to be honest with yourself. Like, do I really want to put in the work is it, is it within my grasp? Um, not, we, we believe most students can increase um, you know, as, as high as they want, but it's just a matter of how much work are they actually going to be able to put in in the time and is it worth it? You need to have perspective and, and Becca and your, your counselors can help you with this. You need to keep in mind that these, this is one piece of the process and it's not a definition of your value as a student or your value as a human being. Uh, or even sometimes exactly where you're going to go to college certainly has an effect on that. You need to keep this all in perspective so that the stress uh, doesn't, doesn't cause more negative than the prepping uh, could cause positive. And then finally, it's kind of an odd one out here. It's really important. Uh, you've got to take notes. When you're prepping, you've got to take good notes, meaning you've got to understand exactly what you've covered. Uh, this is part of the deliberate approach, what you're having trouble with, you want to keep a log for yourself. If you just go and do a bunch of problems, uh, it's not really that helpful. Uh, we use a tool we call the error log, which is extremely powerful, and that's part of that guide. Um, so we can share that with you. It's all about taking really concise but important notes to help make sure that your practice is actually deliberate. And finally, good beats perfect every single time. Just do it. Uh, a lot of students, they put it off. They're worried about it. I don't know. If you're, if you're not sure, uh, first thing we say is call us, we'll help you through it. But if you want to just tackle it on your own or you want to just try it yourself, um, you know, download some practice materials. Uh, both websites for both test makers have practice materials. Just dive in, get started, get a feel for it uh, and, and get the ball rolling. And that beats perfect every single time. So uh, last slide before we end for questions here is, is what does Signet do um, for students? How do we work with our students? We worked with many, many German school students before. Uh, we create a personalized plan for students. So we help everything we just described there, we will do for uh, your students. Uh, we walk through from, from diagnostic exam to final sitting uh, and we create a personalized plan. Um, everything we do is one-on-one -on -one, and we work with incredible mentors. Um, so uh, your student will be paired with somebody who can help hold them accountable and do that in a way that uh, feels good for them and, and perhaps most importantly feels good for the family. Uh, not that many battles, generally speaking, when, uh, when our, our team is involved. Uh, as I mentioned, we work from beginning to end. And even if you call us and don't decide to work with us, we can at least help you kind of at that starting point decide when to start, how to start and go all the way through to the end to help decisions on should we retest? Um, is this the score that we want to stop with? We have a team approach. Um, so in, in our organization, you would work with an, uh, a coach or a tutor. And then that tutor is, is uh, supervised very closely by a senior staff member. 
and that tutor is on a team with other tutors. So uh, you're not just getting the one tutor, but you're getting the whole experience of the whole company. Additionally, we have a lot of experience um, in all sorts of aspects of the, the high school process. So we can bring a perspective to test prep uh, that makes it bigger than just test prep. Uh, and then finally, as I mentioned earlier, we really, you know, our philosophy is less time on prep, more time for life. Uh, so we try to get you in and out as quickly as possible to meet the goals that, that you have for yourselves uh, or for your students. Um, and so that's it. Uh, we'll turn to questions now. And while we're collecting questions, Sheila, if there's anything else uh, that you have to add, please, please do. Thanks, Jay. Um, yeah, I thank everybody for, for bearing with us. It's kind of a long presentation, but we wanted to give you a really good lay of the land so you can make the decisions you need to make for your students uh, and have all the context that's relevant to you. Um, you know, even though we put so much into this presentation, you would be surprised at how much more Jay and I can tell you. So um, please do uh, come to us with your questions either here in this uh, in, in the chat or you know, you're know you always welcome to email us. I'm gonna put um, my email address and Jay's in the, uh, in the chat here so you can find us. Uh, if you wanna talk through a, a particular situation that you think only applies to your student, um, chances are it applies to more students, so please ask it. Um, but if you wanna have a personal conversation, we're happy to do that too. All right, so any questions? Um, the, the German school uh, group is uh, typically an inquisitive bunch. I usually get a lot of questions, sometimes get put on the spot. So now's the time. If anybody has uh, a, a anything that they wanna ask, or even Becca, if you've got any questions that you know might be circulating um, uh, kind of in, in the air there. Um, I did wanna just clarify, generally we do a PSAT in 10th grade. So as far as the timeline goes, uh, in spring of 10th grade, you will have a sort of a diagnostic available. Um, the PSAT is a little bit, it's a little bit different than the official SAT, but um, unfortunately this year we did have to cancel it for those of you guys who are here in ninth grade. Next year, you will have something to start with. Um, we do it in March or April of 10th grade. We've got one question here. I'll let Sheila take that one. What are our, our rates? Sure, yeah, I actually just typed an answer here because I thought you guys would be talking some more. So our rates range from 165 an hour up to 205 an hour, and we do have discounted packages that are based on a time frame for prep. Um, generally, what we do is we have students do diagnostics. We do those for free, and then you'll have a call with either me or Jay to review those diagnostics to talk about what we think uh, your student might need, what a good goal score is, and what kind of program we would recommend, and whether you really need to do that with a tutor or whether if your student is quite disciplined, you could probably have them do it on their own. And, and we take a policy of we're going to be really transparent to you. Uh, we never want to sell anyone something they don't need. Um, so you can trust that, that uh, we're not going to um, tell you you need tutoring if you really don't. We see a lot of talented kids come in who um, do those diagnostics and are fairly close to their goal score. So we're happy to tell you where to get the materials to do your practice and, and have you go on your way. Any other questions? All right, I think, Becca, should we wrap? So you have, there is one question. I think yeah. she's muted. Here we go. <laughs> Sorry, hi, I just, uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. yep. Okay, mm -hmm. so a couple of slides ago, you were talking about um, scheduled practice tests. Can you yeah. explain what that is? I haven't heard of that before. Sure, yeah. Um, students, uh, what we recommend is that they should be planning to take full length practice tests throughout their uh, test prep. Uh, and so generally what it looks like is you want to start by learning comp student, you want to do practice sections. In order to actually get an experience of the actual test, you really should be sitting down to do full length exams. The specifics of that student's kind of trajectory and their goal score and where they are and also generally their anxiety level and all that, we may recommend uh, fewer or more practice tests. And so the way we generally will do this is if we were working in person, uh, we often have practice test dates that um, our students can join in our center. But if not, uh, our tutors would help uh, define when those practice tests would be and then give students the materials uh, to take those at home. They take the test, um, score the test, or, or score, we would score the test for them. And then in the next session with their tutor, they would use that as data to understand how did our preparation go. 
So for example, uh, you know, if you're uh, trying to learn how to cook a, 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 a meal, you're, you're gonna practice a bunch of different cooking techniques. It's a really complex, fancy meal, or maybe it's multiple courses and you practice those multiple courses, but if it's a high stakes event, uh, you definitely wanna put that whole meal together at least once uh, before you have all your guests over, or before the wedding party arrives. And, and so this is the essentially the way that we do that. And sometimes for some students, it, it's a massive boost of confidence. They're like, man, I'm doing so well. And for other students, it's a reality check. They think they're studying hard, but they're not. And it's like, oh, okay, my goal score is here, but my practice test is coming back here. It also gives us data to understand whether or not we should um, contract or expand the testing, uh, the, the sort of test prep timeline. So if uh, they take a practice test and they're way beyond where we think they need to be, they, they should be on the timeline that we're working off of, then we'll say, hey, you might consider testing sooner. Um, and then, you know, just as often it can happen where you have a student who's a little bit behind, and then we say, hey, listen, we wanna make sure that we're managing expectations and we understand what this timeline should look like. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. So the practice test would be through Signet, right? I wasn't sure if that's something that you sign up with the college board or if it's no, something you do in your yeah. bedroom. It's just something through, that yeah. Signet offers. Okay, yes. Right. Thank so, you. So um, just to clarify that, um, when we have students do practice tests, we like to have them use official materials. Mm -hmm. And so the college board has released a number of tests that we like to use if a student is doing the SAT. Uh, and then if the student's doing the ACT, the ACT has also released its tests. So those are freely available. And, you know, even if your student's not working with us, we recommend that they take practice tests and we can point you towards those resources. Right. Um, we also do, um, Normally, not during the time of COVID, we, we do uh, tests in our center. So we get a group of students together and we have a proctor, they have bubble sheets and it feels a lot like the real exam. That's a really great um, sense of the experience, a chance to practice the endurance necessary, put everything together as Jay was saying. Uh, now during uh, the coronavirus situation, we have moved to online proctoring. So we set up a Zoom call just like this. We have a proctor on one end and a bunch of students muted on the other and they're all taking their tests. And so we can kind of monitor what they're doing and call time and then we have them send in their answers and we grade them and discuss with them. Great. All right. Thank you. Any, anyone else? All right. Becca? Should awesome. You call it? Okay. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, thank you guys so much for coming. I think this, we've had more people here than in some of our in-person presentations. <laughs> um, but thank you so much. This is always super helpful. Um, and I think this was being recorded. So if you wanted to go back over it, I'll be able to send that out um, to, you know, watch it again if you want. Um, and if you have any questions, let's information's right there, info at Signet. If it's a Signet specific question, you can always email me. Um, but it's, uh, it's definitely something we're all thinking about, especially now uh, for 11th grade, everything is up in the air, but um, I'll be in touch with that as well. And um, I just a note on Signet, we've been working together for a long time. Um, and these guys, I absolutely trust, no strings attached. They're wonderful tutors. Jay and Sheila really have cultivated a, a really nice environment where their tutors are as much counselors as they are tutors. So <laughs> thank you guys. Mm -hmm. um, we've had great feedback from our students who have used you guys in the past. So if you need anything from them, definitely let them know or let me know and I can put you in touch as well. But thank you everyone for participating and um, we'll, we'll speak soon. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Thanks, Becca. Becca. Appreciate it. Sure thing. Thank you.